Hello, everybody. Welcome to Topics in Digital Law Practice, Week 9, the final week in which the topic is social media and the law or social media and lawyers. I'll uh, leave that to uh, Ernie to, to give me a, an actual title there. This is My name is John Mayer, and I'm the Executive Director of Cali. Here's a picture for the disembodied voice you are hearing. I want to remind everybody that there is no CLE credit uh, offered for this course. Um, I understand that some states allow for self-reporting. That's great. That's entirely your responsibility, however. There are three goals to remind you again in this course. Our, our goals were to uh, give students, law students especially, access to uh, the most up-to-date information about uh, law practice in the 21st century. Um, we also uh, went a little bit out of our way to invite law faculty to attend so that they could be informed about the changing nature of law practice and that that would inform their teaching. And we wanted to create an enduring resource after the fact, uh, which is the archive of this course and the materials that we created, so that uh, law schools could build on it or that others could benefit from, uh, from it after the fact. Um, and that's why we call this a MOOC, a Massive Online Open Course. So here's the websites that are most relevant. TDLP.classcaster.net is the blog where the course gets archived and where there are all the major links to things like the homework wiki, which is at TDLP.wikispaces.com. If you're tweeting about this, please include the hashtag TDLP. If you want to follow uh, and find information about it, follow uh, Cali Org or myself, John P. Mayer, um, because that's where I would, uh, on Twitter, say things about this course. The uh, homework wiki is where you put your homeworks for everybody to see, including uh, myself. And as you complete the homeworks, you put a little dash, uh, in this case would be dash nine dash, to indicate that you finished the homework, and then I give you a badge. And this week's badge looks like that. That's the homework for social media. And there's another badge uh, that's relevant this week, and that is the uh, the course completion badge, which if you finish all the homeworks, then you would see the uh, – then we'll give you a, a TDLP uh, course completion badge as well. So uh, I, hope, I hope that makes you drool. Please, John, give me that. The homeworks are part of the course. You get benefit out of doing them. Um, that's part of my role as the um, master of ceremonies of the course is to act as a motivator for you. you, you know, I want to motivate you to uh, do the work and to uh, gain the benefit of the learning. You can, of course, ask questions while this is uh, while this is playing live. Um, so type your questions in the question box, and after we're done, we'll, uh, we'll we'll gather those questions and run through as many of them as we can. And um, if there's uh, more questions than we could get time to, we'll we'll ask uh, and beg the uh, presenter to come back and maybe uh, type in some of those answers into the into the wiki. So this week is uh, Ernie Svensson, also known as Ernie the Attorney, uh, and he's going to be speaking on social media for lawyers. And um, Ernie, I like this picture the best of you. Um, I understand you graduated from a Loyola Law School, and I assume that's the Loyola in New Orleans. That's correct. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, and you practice. Uh, you're you're a you're a solo practitioner as well as do uh, commercial litigation. I'd been following you for a while on Twitter and reading your blog. And, um, and although I didn't know you before this course, I thought you know you you look like somebody who who has expertise in this space. Um, and, uh, and I was really delighted that you uh, accepted our offer to uh, speak. And so I'm going to um, hand the hand the reins over to you and uh, let you get started. Oh, great! Well, thank you, John. Thanks for having me here. And um, yeah, it's it's been a pleasure getting to know you. And I'm really excited about doing this kind of presentation online, which of course is not ironic, but actually entirely appropriate because uh, this is all about how we do things online and how we share information online. So I've, I'm. I'm clicking here. I think I'm going to share my screen now. So if you have any yep, problems, I can see it. Let me know. Okay, great. All right. So this is a topic that I've given uh, a discussion. I've, I've talked about in many different forums to many different types of people in the legal profession, sometimes to judges, sometimes to academics, sometimes to students, most times to practitioners. And it's one of those topics that really you could go on for hours because 
first of all, it's, um, it's, it's something of great interest for various reasons, um, not just to lawyers and legal professionals, but to pretty much anybody who is trying to understand how we use these new tools to reach people in this digital information age that we're living in. And the other thing that's challenging and interesting at the same time about this topic is that everything that's happening with this topic is, is happening quickly and it's changing quickly. So we're going to talk today, um, I think for about 45 minutes, uh, you know, what is social media, how does it affect the legal profession and so forth. And where this all started for me is I started a blog called Ernie the Attorney back in the year 2002, in March of 2002. So it's, it's been over 10 years now that I've been doing this. And at the time, there was no concept of social media. There were these things called blogs and it was a tool and people were messing around with it. Not many lawyers were doing it, but um, there were a few. And I kind of just found it by accident and I hooked up with some other lawyers who were using this tool. And so pretty much everything I've learned has been as a result of having a blog, this one first, then I started another one related to the use of PDFs in the practice of law, which has to do with how do we manage digital information and then how do we practice paperless lawyering and so forth. So those, those were two blogs I started and I started another one more recently called Digital Workflow CLE, which provides CLE credit for lawyers in Louisiana. And we put out some videos uh, to teach lawyers how to be paperless. So two of the three blogs are related to practical things about how to practice law. This one was really just kind of my forum for sort of speaking and finding other people who are using blogs and social media and connecting with them. So this one is more free form, but this has really been sort of my platform from which I've learned about social media. So as I said, today we're gonna to cover uh, lawyer use of social media. We're gonna talk about maybe some of the best practices because I'm a believer that social media is a, is a, first of all, it's just a tool. So like any tool, you can use it for good or you can make mistakes with it and screw up and cause problems. And of course, since it's a tool that's connected to the internet where there are lots of people and where things tend to persist forever, uh, potentially, then the kind of trouble you can get into can have some pretty serious consequences. But I think that it's important to focus on the benefits. Um, and obviously there are ethical and professional issues for lawyers and we'll talk about those. But overall, I have found social media to be beneficial and I think used properly, it is extremely beneficial. So I wanna focus more on that and not get into all the scary stuff. Uh, or at least that I want to de-emphasize the scary stuff because lawyers tend to focus a lot on things that are uh, risk problems and, and they obsess about them. So the first thing really is what is social media? What is social networking? Um, and really social networking to me is, is not really anything new. It's a familiar thing, which is to say it's a form of communicating with people. And when we were young, you know, we used one form or when, you know, in the past we've used certain kinds of forms of communicating. And now because of the internet, we have new ways of doing it that involve using computers, involve using cell phones or mobile communication technology and using the internet. So when you have these new tools and you have the internet factored in, that's really what changes everything. But otherwise it's really the same principle. So. These are things that most of the people who are listening will, will be familiar with. Social media tools like Facebook, which is the 600 pound gorilla, everybody knows Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn, which is, uh, as many people say, it's like Facebook for professionals. And then there's YouTube, which people may not think of as a social media tool, but it is. Twitter, Flickr, which is for photo sharing photographs. Yelp, which is for sharing reviews of, of um, of locations that people would go to. First it started with just restaurants and now it's pretty much anything. Same thing with Foursquare. And, and all of these tools, which most of which when I started using them, I didn't really understand the benefits or I didn't understand all of the benefits. You know, all of these tools tend to borrow whatever is working really well for one of the other social media sites. So they're all growing. They're all changing in what they, what they do because they will incorporate uh, processes that other similar social networks are using. All of those are social networks and they all tend to coalesce around this idea of friending. They may call it something different, like Facebook calls it friending, LinkedIn calls it contact, 
doesn't matter what you call it. Let's just, for the sake of this discussion, we'll call all of that friendly. And the reason that's important is it's a little different to have a friend in a social media world than it is in real life. So this is uh, my friend Jeff Richardson. He's an attorney in New Orleans. I've known Jeff for a long time. And of course, you know, we've got the pictorial representation of his friends who look more normal than my friends. Uh, and in real life, even though I've known Jeff for a long time, it is very unlikely that I would have a very clear map of just exactly who his friends are. I might know who some of them are because, of course, I would meet them or we would have mutual friends, but I wouldn't necessarily have a list, you know, that I was constantly updated that was posted online that said, here are all Jeff's friends. And same thing with me. He doesn't have that list for me. And in the social media world, you start out the same way. Jeff doesn't necessarily know who my friends are, and I don't know who his friends are. But if we join Facebook, and then if we enable certain things to happen, you know, then what happens is, you know, I can't see Jeff's friends. He can't see mine initially. But then if he sends me a friend request and says, hey, Ernie, do you want to be my friend on Facebook? And I say, yeah, fine. Now all of a sudden something changes, and we get to that point where I can see, assuming that he set or allowed his settings to be a certain way, and of course Facebook is going to default to that, then he can see all my friends and I can see all of his friends and maybe we can see friends of friends and more things like that. But the basic starting out point is that now all of a sudden I have this very clear map of who his friends are. So that's one difference with social media and with Facebook. Another thing is this concept which Facebook uses, and this is something that they borrowed or stole from uh, Twitter because they didn't initially used to have this. But now on your main page, there's kind of this news feed, and then you see things that maybe you posted, but they could be things that other people post. So it, it, I thought of Facebook initially as a blog where I could control things that I posted, but I couldn't control how it looked. But now because of this feature, it's really like a blog that other people get to put things that appear on my page, which is fine if you want you know, your blog to work like that or if you want Facebook to work like that, but that's what happened. So this woman named Mina Serkin is somebody I met at some seminar, and I friended her because I tend to friend everybody on Facebook because I treat it like a blog or an extension of my blog uh, for the most part. And so when she posts this thing about Zsa Zsa Gabor getting ready to sell her mansion, that's not something I had to approve or that I even was given an option to approve. It just appeared on my screen, and then all of a sudden you see these comments appearing below that, and that's not something I'm really controlling. So that's one thing that can happen in Facebook, and that's something that's interesting and not typical. Now, it, so Twitter is the other fast-growing um, social media site, and people always want to say, well, what is Twitter? And, and everybody comes to these new things, and they have their own preconception of what it is based on the elevator pitch they heard from their friend or whatever they read. I like this quote about Twitter because it, Twitter is haphazard. It is very disorganized. And yet you can organize it. So it's not that it's inherently disorganized. It's just kind of a little messy. And that's okay because the purpose of Twitter, unlike Facebook or unlike blogs or other things, is not to create static content or create thoughtful posts. You have 140 characters to say something or to link to something. And that's it. So Twitter is kind of like Facebook where you say, here's my status update, but it's really also like a blog because on in your in your Twitter page where you're following various people, whatever the most recent thing that was said goes to the top. And I think we, most of us know that this is how Twitter works. But um, the, the thing that people say is that, oh, Twitter is just this frivolous thing. It's for teenagers and people who want to share frivolous content. And that's not true. It's not true for any of these tools that they are something defined by the way certain people use them. They're tools, and they can be used in lots of different ways. And in fact, all of these tools wound up getting used in ways uh, that were different than the people who created them even imagined. So they're not, Twitter's not just for teens. It may be that a lot of teenagers use it, although actually the demographics for Twitter suggest that there are actually more older people using Twitter. But this is a good example of why Twitter is an important tool, because Barack Obama, when he gave a speech, I think about a year ago, on immigration, his chief strategy advisor, David Plouffe, did not go with him, but instead stayed home and watched Twitter. Why did he do that? 
because he wanted to see what people were saying on Twitter using the immigration hashtag, which is that pound sign in the word you know, immigration. He wanted to see what people were saying about immigration and specifically what they were saying related to the speech that the president gave. So if it didn't happen before, at this point in time, clearly Twitter has become the go-to tool for people who want to know exactly what is happening now because the fact that people can post quickly, that they can only use 140 characters, that they can post from their cell phones, makes it a tool that people are going to use to talk about things that are happening at this very moment. So Twitter, to me, resembles this device, which is the Associated Press teletype machine. When I worked at the college radio station at Tulane, when I went there undergrad, we had one of these in our in our office, and the school paid a certain amount per month for us to be able to use this. And you know, if you want to, for the newscast, and there actually were people who read the news on the college radio station. I doubt anybody listened to the to the news, but we we read it. And what we did was we would just rip out the news from this Associated Press teletype machine, circle the news stories that we found interesting, and read them over the air. And that's pretty much what a lot of news organizations had been doing for a long time, and to some extent. That's kind of what they do now, except that you know people write the stories and they go get information. But what's happening now is you now don't have to buy the Associated Press teletype machine. You just get an account on Twitter, and then you subscribe to traditional news organizations. So, for example, you could subscribe to CNN Breaking News. You can subscribe to the New York Times. You can subscribe to Anderson Cooper because not only do the news organizations like CNN have feeds, but the individual reporters have feeds. And you know, normally they probably would not have put this out there without charging people or without putting up ads, but because Twitter evolved, they can't ignore it, so they are doing this. And so you're able to get the news pretty much for free, at least breaking news from traditional news sources if you want. So this is not for teens. This is for anybody who wants to follow news and get news immediately. So one of the things that I, I tell lawyers when I give this talk is that the one takeaway I want people to have from this is if they are not using Twitter uh, and, and they, they don't need to say anything, but they should sign up for an account and learn how to use it as a way of gathering news because this is the way to gather news. There is no reason to follow breaking news on TV anymore. You can, If you have a smartphone that has access to some sort of Twitter app, and almost certainly most of you do, this is the way to get breaking news. Now, it's not the way you get thoughtful news. You, for, for that, you have to turn elsewhere. But it, if you want breaking news, what's going on, who's winning the Masters right now, you know, did anything strange happen in the world today, it's going to show up on Twitter first. And you can get local news, too, as well. You can create your own separate feed, so you can have one Twitter stream. They call them lists. So you can have one Twitter list for, let's say, national news. You can have one for local news. And this is an example of, uh, in Louisiana, I follow the Fox News station. I don't watch them on TV. I'm never going to turn the TV on because there's no point. Because anything I would want to know would show up here first, and then I can click on a link and read about it if I want to. But you know, even the Louisiana Bar Association is on Twitter. The ABA is on Twitter. Pretty much every state bar association now is on Twitter. Uh, Eric Mazzone is is the practice manager, or he's involved with the North Carolina Bar Association. So you can you can decide who you want to follow. You can create lists so you can segment it and group it into categories if you want. And this is the way to gather information in the 20th century. The other thing, which really people kind of ignore blogs when they talk about social media, but blogs really are kind of the crown jewel of social media. And so the ABA Journal has a homepage, and on this homepage, they, there's a link over here on the right you see where it says home, news, topics, current issues, and I can't point because I'm, I'm not able to do that, but you see where it says blogs, B-L-A-W-G-S. Well, blogs is sort of the term that a law blogger named Denise Howell coined back in the early, early days, 2003, for law blogs. So if you click on that link, then you would get the page where the ABA Journal tracks all of or you know, most of the law-related blogs and they have a so-called blog directory. And you can look for topics, for author, for region. And so you can find all kinds of interesting information. And you'll see over on the left, 
They even have a, um, a Twitter feed for the person who edits this blog directory. So this is what people do. If you start a blog related to a topic, then you typically get the Twitter name that's closest to the blog name, and you tweet out posts that you have that relate on the blog so that you're reaching the audience that goes to your blog, and you're also reaching the audience that's on Twitter, and if you use Facebook and LinkedIn, and you should, you can also pump out content to those places as well. So all of those things are just channels for communication, and you can tap into them simultaneously or separately, but it's now pretty much the norm that people use these blogs uh, to, to uh, connect to Twitter and so forth. And there's a lot of different law-related blogs, but let's just focus on one. This is one called SCOTUS Blog. It's started by a fellow named Tom Goldstein, who uh, went to, I think, George Washington University. And he, the way he got started in the practice of law was that he used to work with Anina Totenberg. He volunteered to go be her assistant when he was in law school, worked really hard, earned her trust. And then from that position and knowing a lot about the Supreme Court, because she was covering it, when he got out to practice, he decided to focus on being a Supreme Court practitioner. And he was not, he, you know, he didn't clerk for the Supreme Court. He didn't have a, I don't think he necessarily had the kind of resume that otherwise would have put him in the realm of those who handle Supreme Court cases. But he focused on that. And because of his complete niche focus, he developed this following. And of course, then when blogs arose and when lawyers were starting to use them, he quickly saw that that was a tool, made use of this tool. So he, he was on his own, I think, for a long time, and I think he joined a firm, I forget which firm, but this blog has remained under his control and obviously will go with him. And you can see that it has up-to-the-minute information about what's going on in the Supreme Court. It shows you in a very interactive, easy-to-follow way, a full calendar, which is over here on the right, of what the court has pending. And what's interesting about this is there's no reason that the U.S. Supreme Court couldn't have done this. And there's no reason that any large law firm couldn't have done this. What's interesting is that a fellow who wasn't at the time in a large law firm but had an interest in the Supreme Court was able to put this together and make a, a site that's probably more useful than anything that's out there, including what the Supreme Court puts out. And they've got the calendar, and then they also have, of course, a Twitter feed, and you can follow that. So they took all those elements and they created this tool. And it's a very useful tool. And there are a lot of tools like this related to any area you're interested in, immigration law, social security, any kind of law that you might imagine, there is almost certainly now a law-related blog for it. Ernie? So all of those things are social media tools, and we're starting to see increased use of social media tools. Uh, Ernie, this is John. Across the, uh, across the legal spectrum. And that's, Yeah. Can, do you think that uh, Goldstein? Yes. Do you think that Goldstein got the job at the uh, at the law firm because of the blog, or that they were related? Um, I would. Yeah, I think I think a lot of what's happened in his life started because he focused on that as a practice area, and and so forth. I think that he, yeah, he probably was invited to be part of that firm, not just because he had the blog, but I think the blog gave him the ability to control his message and made it completely portable. So I think it probably gave him a great, greater bargaining position, maybe opened up some opportunities. But what's most interesting is that let's say it doesn't work out for him at the firm where he is. The firm doesn't control this thing. He does. So he mm -hmm. takes it with him and he goes to the firm and he leaves if he wants to and he takes it with him. So these tools give the person who creates them the control. They don't have to wait for somebody else to build it and then say, well, now I owe you something and I'm you know, beholding to you because you built it, please let me use it. Anybody can build these tools themselves and have control. And we'll, talk, we'll see another example of that in a second. Um, but th uh, does that answer that question? Yes, it does. Okay, okay. So the thing about social networking and the, all these statistics, they quickly go out of, out of date. So, but this one, let's say social networking accounts for 56% of the time people spend online. People are spending a lot more time doing social networking research before they purchase something because it's more important to people to know what other people that they, whom they know and trust think about something. So it has a huge effect.
feedback and purchasing decisions, which is why, of course, retailers and people who are promulgating goods are using these social media tools. And the same is true for lawyers. So we know that these statistics are always growing. Facebook now is estimated to have a, a population or a user base of 84 million people. We know that Facebook is used extensively by people, that 50% of the people who use it log in every day, 35 million people update every day, 25% by phone. That's got to be higher by now. I'm sure it's like closer to 50%. The average user spends about 55 minutes a day, and the average user has 130 friends. Now, the average user, my daughter, who is in college, has supposedly 1,300 friends. That's not unusual for people who are in college and high school. Are those really friends? In the traditional sense, maybe not, but that's those are the statistics. So social networking among th this age group is interesting because you see in 2008 that only 9% of the people were using social networks. But look at what happens two years later. Suddenly it jumps up dramatically, and that's probably actually over 50% now. And it's going to keep growing because... What do human beings like to do the most? They like to engage and relate with other human beings. So these social network tools allow that to happen. They make it easy. Um, and they allow people to stay in touch with people uh, across you know, geographic divides, across time divides, and so forth. So it's, these are just going to keep growing. And naturally, that means that lawyers are going to be using them most, I mean, more, and then encounter more use by their clients and so forth. So lawyers right now use social networks mostly for professional networking, but socializing is a big part of it. And they don't use it as much for investigation, but they probably will because of the things that we're going to talk about in a second. Which social networks do they use? They use LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is growing a lot more now nowadays, but they, they use Facebook as well. And they're not using Twitter as much, but they will be using Twitter more, I predict, not just to gather general news, but also to do investigation in handling their cases. When Twitter really took off was right after President Obama got elected and installed in office. And you can see that because in 2009, while the word Obama was the top word and so was the swine flu word H1N1, Twitter was considered a top word because that was really when it had its most explosive growth. And even the, the AMLAW 100 firms back in January of 2010, 29 of those firms were were, so, were tweeting or using Twitter, I would be surprised if not all of them were using it now. Now the question of how would they use it or what you know, what does that really mean, um, here are two AMLAW 100 firms, Skadden Arps, which has approximately 2,000 attorneys, and Wild Gottschall, which has 20 offices worldwide. It's a global law firm. These, uh, these firms have not that many followers if you consider – the status of Rex uh, Lawless, who was a law student in Springfield, Illinois, and had 73,000 followers. So again, the, the message is, if you take this tool and you want to use it yourself and you are dedicated to using it, it's really more, you, you know, your success depends more on the effort and knowledge that you bring to the equation as opposed to how much money you have in your pocket or how much of a marketing team you have, because Skadden Arps and Lyle Gottschall have plenty of money and no doubt have a marketing team, and yet they're only able to, um, to get 13 or 1,700 followers, whereas this fellow who's in his third year in law school can get 73,000. So these tools are great equalizers. They're very democratic. If you want to use them, you can, and you're going to be as powerful as anybody else unless that person has a greater desire to use it and greater knowledge and persistence. Social media can be a problem, as we have heard many times. You know, not the most recent one, but certainly one of the high-profile cases was Representative Anthony Weiner, who misused Twitter to his great detriment and found himself out of office. This kind of thing is going on in litigation as well with lawyers. And the first area that it showed up was with Facebook, because, of course, when, whenever people are chattering away about their personal lives, thinking that something will never come back to haunt them, Invariably, it does, and lawyers who have lawsuits find themselves looking for that kind of information. So clever lawyers uh, who had cases where they thought incriminating evidence might be in Facebook requested that information. And initially, um, 
the, the person who for whom the information was sought would say, no, 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 this is private. You can't have it because Facebook requires people to log in and sometimes it requires you to be friends before you can get to it. But the court said, no, no, it's not shielded just because it's private. So the court assumed Facebook was in fact private and said, it's not for monologues. So it's not, you know, private in the sense that you speak only to yourself, you're speaking to other people, but um, you are selecting who your friends are. But if, if information on there is relevant, uh, photos, profiles, whatever, that information has to be turned over. So that's been the law. It's pretty clearly the law. And most of the cases deal with that. And this is another case that dealt with it. But what's interesting about this case is it focuses on something that explains why Facebook is so valuable. It's not just like email where a person says something. It's this idea that if people are going to be constantly posting about what they're doing and what they're thinking and where they are and who their friends are and who they're with, really what you're getting when you look at Facebook, if you have the clear picture, if you have complete access to it, is you're able to pretty much determine somebody's state of mind at the time of posting. So if you think about that Casey Anthony case where the, the mother who was accused of killing her daughter who ultimately was acquitted, uh, but everybody thinks she's guilty because there were photos of her partying on Facebook the night after her daughter disappeared and she knew that the daughter had disappeared. That's an example of having access to possibly her state of mind or at least something that looks like her state of mind at the time. So courts are saying if that state of mind evidence is relevant or could be relevant, then you have to turn it over. So increasingly people are getting access to Facebook information. And matrimonial lawyers love Facebook because, of course, a lot of the problems that surface in a marriage uh, often show up in, in Facebook conversations. They consider it the unrivaled leader for divorce evidence, and most of them say that Facebook is their primary evidence source. So Facebook and these other social media tools are now becoming repositories for information that lawyers want to get at. So what happens if, you know, how do you get information from Facebook? You can subpoena Facebook, and that would be the, the, the best option if you just want to make absolutely sure that the person isn't altering the information, because if you ask them for it, they'll say they, they're giving you everything, but maybe they're not. So can you subpoena Facebook? And the answer is, yes, you can subpoena them, but what will they give you? First of all, they're going to cite the Stored Wired Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Um, this will be litigated, and we'll have to decide whether this really applies, but Facebook is going to fight this tooth and nail and say that it, it does apply. And this was the first case where that issue was discussed. And in that case, the person had a MySpace page and a Facebook page. And the court said, well, the stored communication that could apply to private information, meaning the emails and the private back channel communications you can have with other Facebook users that don't appear on your, on your homepage, it would clearly apply to that. The question was, and this case didn't resolve it, was what about the other information um, that is on your Facebook page? And they said, they don't really know about the answer to that question. Um, but like I said, I think Facebook's going to fight that tooth and nail because they're always in trouble for, for supposedly making things uh, too public and so forth. So what Facebook will do if you give them a subpoena is they will provide you, assuming that the subpoena is valid from the federal court or California state court, they will give you basic subscriber information, meaning they will say, yes, that person has an account, which is pretty much useless. They won't provide user content, and they'll cite the Stored Communications Act. They won't, there's no way to talk to anybody by phone. They don't make this user friendly. Um, their subpoena requests are handled by outside counsel. So that's pretty much who you have to deal with if you want to get information from Facebook. Jurors use Facebook, and they use these social media tools as well, and that also creates potential problems. So in this case, which was a seven-month-long trial that happened in, P in Pennsylvania that involved a public corruption matter that was high profile and everybody was paying attention to it in Pennsylvania, this juror, on the eve of the, of the deliberations being announced, said, stay tuned for a big announcement on Monday. He, t he had a Facebook page, a Twitter page, and he had a blog. And he posted this, and then the local media found out about it and made a big deal about it on Sunday evening. And so, of course, early Monday morning, there's a meeting with the judge and the attorneys, 
and the juror, and it's, it turned out this juror actually had not said anything incriminating. He had pretty much given very bland press releases. But th this all happened in the era before judges were paying attention to this, so he, he and the other jurors were not given an instruction saying, do not use social media. Nowadays, that kind of instruction is the norm. But the court said, I looked at everything this guy said, it's harmless ramblings, no prejudicial effect, and that stood on appeal. Now that would be contrasted from this case where the Michigan juror wrote after the prosecution's case, but before the defendant <laughs> put on their case, something that sounds like they had made up their mind, which clearly they were told not to do by the judge. So this is a problem, and these are the kind of things we're starting to see more of. We are also seeing research by jurors, and this is an example of, of that kind of thing where the juror used his iPhone to research a key jury instruction term, and as a result, the Court of Appeals reversed, saying that, that was misconduct. And this is not social media per se, but it's the same problem, namely what happens when you have ever-present access to the Internet. Even if the court tells you not to use the Internet, people tend to go ahead and use it anyway because we live in a world now where we are very comfortable with looking up information on our phones and our laptops and our iPads. And when somebody tells us not to do that, that almost sounds like telling us, uh, you know, we can't use the bathroom or something. So we're going to see more of these problems. Um, and, and so and this, okay, this is an example of a case where the trial lawyers uh, are Googling the jurors to find out more about them. The trial judge said stop, stop doing it. Um, on appeal, that was brought up as one of the issues, and the Court of Appeals said, yeah, you can do that. The judge was wrong, but it was harmless error, so, so they didn't reverse. The Court of Appeals said that if the plaintiff's counsel had the foresight to bring his laptop to court uh, and there was public Wi-Fi, they didn't explain where the public Wi-Fi came from, but somehow there was wireless access there. And they said, you know, sorry, the defendant didn't show up. That's their problem. So courts are starting to say, we live in a world where that, that access is pervasive and we're used to that and whoever brings their device that can do it, other than the jurors, uh, that's okay. What about jurors who use Twitter? Um, you get into all kinds of problems there. And what you can do is if you search Twitter, you can type in the words jury duty, and you'll find out, you know, the people are tweeting about their jury duty experiences, that, no, they're off to jury duty, or maybe they've made up their mind even before they even showed up to be picked as a jury. Um, and they also have some tips on how, well, they're able to sleep in jury duty and the fact that if their iPod doesn't work, then perhaps that's, terrible and they can't serve on the jury. So you learn a lot about what's going on by typing that in. And here's another example. I changed this fellow's name, but he's actually in New York and he's pretty clever. And I don't think that his jury orientation video said that they were hooded Europeans. So he's being funny. And then he says his favorite part is when people remember things would make him bias. And here you see an example of the hashtag legal tweets, which Theoretically, if you click on that, then you would see everything that everybody else was saying with the words legal tweets, but I don't think that there actually is a viable hashtag for that. He's just being sarcastic. And you see that here because when he realizes he shouldn't be tweeting, he's got a hashtag that says, <laughs> do not arrest me. So the hashtag is both a way of defining a conversation, and it's also kind of like the rim shot in old Bob Jillian days. It's the, um, the tagging, um, you know, funny one. So these are all people who don't know about social media, and so they're not comfortable with the kind of problems that you can have. But what would, let's say, somebody like Al Roker, who actually is a member of the mainstream media and familiar with this sort of problem, what would happen if he were going to have jury duty? Well, he would use Twitter. He's using Twitter. And this is, in fact, what he tweeted out as he was off to jury duty. And then he's, you know, clever, so he's got the word twether with a T because... He wants to let you know he's hip and that, you know, it's all about Twitter and the Twitter. And then he gets to the jury room. And what does he do? He takes a picture of the jury room. Then he realizes, just like the fellow before, that he shouldn't do that, but he deleted the picture. Now, why? Is, and you can still Google for Al Roker jury picture. And what will happen is you'll wind up at this gossip site, TMZ.com, and you'll find the post because once he tweeted it out, he's Al Roker, somebody screen captured it. And then they send it to TMZ, and it's up there forever. So good example of how 
something that you post, depending on if you're famous or if the event is of great public interest, it winds up being out there forever. Now, Steve Martin uh, took to Twitter, and he decided to make it a comedy routine. Of course, he picked up on the majority duty theme and used this to create his jokes. And his, his Twitter stream is actually pretty funny because he's taken to the using of Twitter as a comic form, and he's you know, using the 140 characters as sort of a, uh, you know, a, a constraint to see what he can come up with, and these were his posts about jury duty, which were pretty funny. There's a book called The World According to Twitter, and it's written by David Pogue, who's the tech columnist for the New York Times. And he's and it's a really funny book. It's really good. And he's got a bunch of different things that um, – and basically what he did is he would tweet out a question. And then he had so many followers by the time he started writing this book that he would take the best responses. So essentially this book, which he's making money off of, all he did was create questions, and then he got clever answers. So, for example – the question, compose the subject line to an email that you really, really don't want to read. He got these, uh, and that's, that's the book there. He got these kind of responses from AT&T regarding your international roaming charges. That's funny because, of course, people will roam and they forget that and they have to pay a lot of money. Regarding what seems to have been your car, you don't want to read that because that means your car probably is smashed. And then this one, which I think is probably the funniest one for that, uh, that subject line. So those are examples of Twitter as humor. Um, this is an example of Twitter, um, you know, giving you a trial tip. Maybe you should remember if you're a criminal defense lawyer that your your client should not have their cell phone um, ringtone on, and it definitely shouldn't be on if it starts tweeting out or starts ringing out something like uh, a rap song that involves the word murder, and he's up for murder. Now, all of this use by social of social media has caused judges in general, and certainly the federal judges, to become concerned. There was a recent survey sent out to, I think, 700, and that's not 700, because there's not 700 judges, but to many federal judges asking them about these sorts of things. And it turned out that um, 30 of them had taken these sorts of actions as a result of improper social media use, removing people from the jury, cautioning them, having mistrials, holding people in contempt, fining them, or doing other things. And what's really interesting is that judges know that jurors are violating the social media ban and they're trying to tell them not to do it and, and try to monitor whether they are. But 79% of these judges who were surveyed said there's no way to know whether they're violating the ban until, of course, something horrible happens. Then, you, then you'll find out, but then it's too late. So they don't, they, they're flummoxed because they don't really know how to monitor or keep track of this. And there's all, you know, we've, we've seen some examples, but these are examples of, Jurors friending the defendant, um, you know, friending a plaintiff is not a good idea, and so forth. So all of those lead to these kind of problems where you're getting more verdicts challenged. You're getting, uh, the, you know, the reason for the challenge is some kind of Internet misconduct, which almost always involves use of social media. And in a third of those cases, you're seeing new trials granted. So this is a very serious problem for judges and for the legal system as a whole. Uh, the Philadelphia Bar Association was asked whether it's okay to friend somebody, uh, if for, for a lawyer to friend somebody using an intermediary, namely his paralegal, because he was deposing this adverse witness and figured out they had social media and said, well, hey, what about if I let my paralegal friend this person because she friends everybody, and that way I can kind of find out what's going on. And the, the Philadelphia Bar Association said you can't, do through an intermediary that which you can't do yourself, and since you can't deceive people, um, then that's really what you're doing. You can't do that. Um, this case is really a case about the lack of uh, common sense, but if you if you connect lack of common sense with a, a social media tool like a blog, and then here's an attorney calling the judge an evil unfair witch and posting it to their blog and a website, the result is disciplinary action and a reprimand and uh, sanction. <laughs> So when you don't have common sense, it's not a good idea to use these social media tools. Uh, what about Facebook use for judges? The Florida Supreme Court said in answer to the question, can a judge friend a lawyer on Facebook, for example? They said, no, that's, that's not a good idea. Blanket response, you can't do it. Ohio, another state that addressed this question, gave the response that most of the other states that are answering this question give, which is 
Yes, provided you have common sense and don't do stupid things. Uh, there was a judge in Louisiana named Roland Belsom who, when he ran for the Louisiana Supreme Court, was a heavy user of Twitter. And after Florida issued that ethics opinion, he asked the people on his uh, Facebook page what they thought about it. And he got 130 responses, which I thought was great, uh, because how often could you put a question like that out there and really get that kind of feedback? And most of the people who followed him on Facebook were not lawyers. So I called out some of the responses and took away the last name so nobody could know who they were. But, the, but generally speaking, the responses from people were, yeah, why can't a judge friend a lawyer? I mean, they're friends in real life, so why would it be a problem on Facebook where, if anything, the friendship connection is even more tenuous, as we've just discussed? So well, I found that interesting that the average person didn't feel like they needed what the Florida, Florida Supreme Court was doing to protect them. They understood that people weren't really close friends on Facebook and it wasn't a big deal. Uh, here's an example of Facebook being used in just every conceivable situation that any of these tools can be used, they will be used. So this is a guy who was ho holding a hostage, had a standoff, and he was still updating his Facebook page. So, I mean, this is kind of crazy, but it just shows you the world that we live in. If, if something is happening in a place where there is cell phone reception and the person has an ability to use a social media tool, don't count out the possibility that they will, in fact, be using the tool. And I think, I don't, I don't have a slide in here, I don't think, but I had one a while back because you remember that there was the raid for Osama bin Laden that happened at 2 in the morning near Abbottabad, and somebody was on Twitter, and they tweeted out, oh, there's helicopters landing. I wonder what's up with that. So anything that's happening in this world, on this planet, that happens in a place where there's a cell phone connection is probably going to be tweeted out. Now, this was an interesting case because this uh, Wyoming judge said, yes, defendant, I'm going to give you probation provided you friend your probation officer, which when I read this, I thought this is going to be challenged immediately by the ACLU. It just seems a little overreaching. But then I thought, well, I'll just go search in this site called OpenBook, which was a site um, that kind of pulls out of Facebook things where people have set their privacy settings to zero, and then you can search in there for things and find things. So let's say I type in jury duty. I hate my probation officer in OpenBook. And these were the results I got. So clearly these guys who appear to have been convicted and have a probation officer because of some sort of drug-related offense, I'm just guessing, uh, they're saying on their Facebook page they hate their probation officer. So maybe if they were friends with their probation officer, they wouldn't say that. Um, and then this, this is just another example. You know, everything, all these tools now, you can use them for anything. And lately, the, the new thing is you can choose your airline seat based on your social network. Are people going to do this? I don't know. Some people probably will. So these tools are all pervasive. They're being used all over the place. And the question is, what can we as lawyers take away from this? What kind of advice can you give? And what I tell people is, first of all, Think of what Wayne Gretzky said. You know, he said he's going to skate to where the puck is going to be and not where it's been. That's what made him great. I think that applies to lawyers. Um, if you want to be a lawyer in today's modern world, and you, is, if there's any chance that one of your cases is going to involve social media, and there's a really good chance that it will, and yet each day there's a greater chance, then it behooves you to understand something about it. It's the same problem we run into with electronic discovery. The lawyers who know how digital information works are better at e-discovery because they understand how to ask for things and they understand the constraints. And the same thing is true in social media. If you're going to do discovery or have cases where discovery is going to be sought from you, you need to understand something about these tools at some rudimentary level. And the more you use them, the more you're going to understand. And why would you use these tools? Well, it's kind of a useful marketing tool. It's a useful information gathering tool. So why not take the parts of it that are useful to you either in building your practice, in gathering information, and get good at that and, and, and approach it from that standpoint. And then when you approach it from that standpoint, you can decide how much of it that relates to broadcasting information would be useful to you too. And then you can go down that path. But to ignore it completely because you think it's 
weird or you think it's too risky or you just don't get it, you're really not taking advantage of the situation. And I think all lawyers need to do that. So that's really my message. And I think the best place to start is with Twitter because it's a great information gathering tool in general. Um, so that's really my basic message. And I hope that you guys uh, got something out of it. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Ernie, thanks so much. That was wonderful. We do have um, some questions that uh, that uh, look rather rather challenging. Uh, you should be able to see them up on your screen now, but I'll uh, uh, yep, read them out. Um, can you comment on reports of employers uh, requesting a password and full access to employees or prospective employees' yeah, Facebook I, profiles? I, yeah, I read about that, and what I initially I was I mean I've I had seen that for a while, and it doesn't surprise me. In fact, my son even told me that that happened to a friend of his when he was applying for a job recently. So, I mean, the big takeaway is, you know, for now, don't post things on Facebook or clean up your Facebook page because a prospective employer could ask you, and if you say no, um, that could be a problem. Now, Facebook is supposedly going to sue those people who are doing that because Facebook wants to, you know, encourage people to use Facebook. That's one thing that to be borne in mind. The other thing is I heard just recently – Somebody say that they had looked at those cases closely and that mostly that's happening where the person is applying for a security job as a you know uh, high level security person and they really need to know what sort of person they are. So I don't know. That's but that's what I know about that one. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well um, uh, number uh, two. Um, should I let employees tweet? You want me to jump to that one? Sure, go ahead. Well, actually let me comment. Um, Jonathan Ezor is a law professor at uh Turo and he gathers, um, I think it's under the hashtag uh, LSTOT, Law Student Tweet of the Day, um, TOTD maybe. These are law students tweeting unfortunate messages that they might want to delete. Um, and he does it as sort of a public, uh, uh, let's, let's say, um, education slash shaming exercise to indicate that, look, you're about to be lawyers. Right. Maybe you should be careful about what you say. <laughs> So yeah, the next one. Um, uh, yeah, no, partner I mean, in a firm. Sorry, go ahead. Should, yes. Yeah, so should they let? So I, I think this is a controversial question, and I think my opinion is probably not the mainstream opinion. But I understand the mainstream opinion. So my opinion is: let's take the last question part of it first. Should I develop a social media policy? That's not going to save you. I mean, you should yes, you should have a policy. You should say what it is people can and can't do, and you should try to be realistic about what they're likely to do regardless of what you tell them to do. So you should try to have a policy. Yes, that's a good idea. Can you control people's use of social media? No, not really. Can you influence it? Yes, somewhat. And how can you influence it? Well, I think you most influence it and most influence it in a beneficial way by not saying you should never do it but rather realize that this is a, a powerful democratizing tool. At its core, that's what it is. You know, it can be used for good, it can be used for evil, it can be used by Republicans, it can be used by Democrats, by people in Egypt, you know, anybody. But it's a democratizing tool because it allows anybody to say anything to a large number of people. So if you want people to not say anything on behalf of your company, define that. If you want people not to say anything at all, that's going to be harder to do because they're just going to do it. So I think the trick is to figure out how to use it in a beneficial way and then figure out how to give your employees the right guidance so that they use it in a way that's helpful to you. But to say in a blanket way you can't do it, that's just going to increasingly be a very difficult thing to do and to police. Gotcha. Um, I noticed um, I'm, does it I'm going to call, does it I'm going to call an audible question. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I noticed you didn't you didn't mention too much about Yelp, and there's got to be an increasing number of people yelping lawyers saying you know he was good he was bad or something like that. Um, how how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think, I think Yelp is yeah I think Yelp is really key. Yeah, I think Yelp is keyed to a place, and so if a person if a lawyer has a, a firm and he's on Yelp as a place, and people could talk about it because once you give once you create a a, a noun, a place, you know, thing, whatever that people can, you know, verb to, 
um, then you can have a problem. But I don't think Yelp is so much the problem. The next biggest growing one right now is Pinterest, because Pinterest uses pictures, and people like pictures. They're very visual people. Uh, and a lot of people say, well, you know, it's mostly the demographic is uh, women, and it's mostly shopping. Right, that's the demographic now, because maybe that's what the immediate user interest is. But pictures can be anything, and there are lawyers who are using Pinterest as a way of organizing YouTube links and all kinds of other things. Um, and so, you know, yeah, all these tools are just tools. It's like pin the tail on the donkey. There's the donkey. What can you pin on the donkey? And the tool is the donkey, and what you can pin on it is anything that technically, you know, is allowed through technology. How will that happen? We never can predict. So these things all grow in crazy, unpredictable ways, but they're all growing. And I guess, so back to my theme is don't ignore it and say, or don't ignore any one of them. Say, oh, that's new. It's, that's ridiculous. Like, you have to pay attention to Pinterest now. I do, I feel like. And I don't really completely understand it, <laughs> but I know it's going to be used, so you need to pay attention to it. All right. Does social media replace all other forms of advertising? Um, no, no, I mean, definitely. I mean, Procter and Gamble isn't going to give up on all those things. Uh, but I think it, it, I think it, again, is a democratizer and, um, it, it doesn't rep like, there's a whole bunch of lawyers and I'm one of them who would never have tried to build their law practice by using any of those advertising tools. So it didn't replace it for me. What it did was it created a new outlet where I discovered that I could do something that isn't advertising at all. It isn't even marketing in the traditional sense. Uh -huh. And this actually ties together to the question, how personal should a lawyer be on social media? The answer is you should be yourself. Like this is, this is a hard thing, I think, for a lot of lawyers to grasp. And I understand that because I wouldn't have grasped it if I hadn't just, you know, gone through this machine personally and experienced the transformation and understand it in a direct way. But, you know, I have a blog. I've had all these Twitter tools and everything else. And the, what I've learned is that people have engaged with me because I never intended to, I didn't use any of this as a marketing tool. I was using it purely experimentally to see what, how I could use it. And so I would write it, uh, you know, for my friends. I envisioned that I was writing for my friends. And I envisioned I was writing or for people who thought that lawyers were stiff shirts and wouldn't speak to them in down to earth way. That's how I wrote. So then as a result, what happened? People, were engaged with that because they thought, that's kind of weird. You're not a typical lawyer. So if you want to stand out, the way to stand out is not to be like a typical lawyer, which is to say, be yourself. And who are you? You know, well, you're not really the sum of any of the things you do necessarily, but that's how people kind of decide who you are. So if you can live with the fact that people don't know who you are exactly and they decide who you are based on what you put up, then why not put things up like, hey, I play the guitar. You know, then you, you know, somebody who plays the guitar who otherwise wouldn't know that, even if they were your friend, unless they happen to see you playing the guitar, says, oh, I didn't know you play guitar, let's get together and jam. You know, I mean, that's how human beings interact. And uh -huh. I think that's the thing that lawyers have kind of not tapped into. And that's what this stuff allows you to tap into. And I think the lawyers who use it that way, most, you know, many of them are finding great success. Some of them are just doing what Tom Goldstein did and being very, lawyerly and focusing on a niche area and that's fine too but it's a it's a tool and it works differently than advertising and the key is to be human okay we're, we'll we'll use one more one more question here and then our we're, we're getting uh time is pretty much up um in the future won't lawyers just uh outsource this they'll hire somebody to do all their social media for them and does that work um yeah well there actually already are yeah, there actually already are lawyers who do that, and um, I, I actually hired a social media consultant not to tweet out for me, but I learned about what that process is like, and I've learned about it from other lawyers who do it, and I think they will, but the most successful ones will do, will control their own message. So the best thing to do is to get a social media consultant who takes care of all the, uh, you know, pesky details like con connecting the Twitter feed to the Facebook page and, you know, getting all the infrastructure in place and maybe even scheduling things so that things come out in a scheduled way. And I don't, by scheduling, I mean, like, for example, with Twitter, one of the things that, you know, people tend to do when they start out with Twitter and they want to talk, and I, I did this, is you, 
you re you'll be reading something and then you'll be retweeting and you'll be pumping things into your Twitter stream at the moment when you happen to be reading things that you think are cool. So what uh -huh. happens is the people who are reading that all of a sudden get, you know, six tweets from you in a row and they don't like that. So it's better yeah. to tweet out things in a kind of, you know, separated by time. So there are people, so the social media experts, what they do is they do that and then they measure the metrics. And then, so they work with you to kind of help you understand what messages is resonating with people and how to make it optimal. But the actual writing of the posts and putting the message out there, I think that lawyers should do that. And I think, or at least I think that somebody in the law firm should do that, not just say, oh, well, we hired somebody to do that for us because they're not going to know what kind of tone to give. They're going to be afraid if they say something that doesn't make sense or that you don't like, they're going to be questioned. So it's best for you to do it yourself. Very good. Ernie, thank you so much for that presentation. I really appreciate you uh, you joining us. Um, uh, and so I'm going to uh, get ready to close this up. Um, the homework assignment for this week is up on the screen. Um, it's uh, three parts. I want you to find three examples of a lawyer or law firm using social media effectively. That is, you know, they provide a service or information that could lead to someone seeking out this lawyer or firm as a client. So we're looking for examples of blog posts, Twitter tweets, podcasts, Facebook pages. If you can link to them, put the link into the homework wiki and a short explanation of why you think they are effective. Uh, the the backside of this uh, assignment is uh, part two. Find three examples of a lawyer or law firm who uh, who don't use who didn't use social media in an effective way. Um, again, if you can link to them, uh, put that into the wiki. If you don't feel comfortable in a public forum saying, uh, ha ha, look at this, uh, crappy use of social media, you know, then, then at least put a, uh, so I saw a Facebook page where the lawyer said something, um, critical of a judge. That would be a poor example of uh, use of social media. Um, I'm not trying to let you off the hook for doing the homework, but, but I, I, I would understand where you wouldn't want to be associated with a, with a critique from just doing a homework assignment. The last piece is uh, is part three. I want you to use, since this is the last class, I want you to use some form of social media, uh, a blog comment, a blog itself if you have a blog, uh, Twitter or Facebook, uh, to make people aware of the archive of this course. If you liked this course or if you didn't like this course, uh, I'm, I'm not going to hold you to you must say something positive, um, or a specific class, um, then I want you to post a link and say, you know, attended this course. It was a great thing. It's all archived here. Um, uh, avoid this fellow. He goes on and on and on. Um, use a hashtag TDLP if you possibly can, you know, and uh, put a link into the homework wiki so that we can see uh, what you say. Now, now having said that, having uh, asked you in, in homework to use social media, we, of course, want your specific feedback for this course. We created a Survey Monkey survey, uh, so follow that link, um, and we'll also post the link in other places. Uh, and, and let us know what went right, what went wrong in this course. Um, I've learned an enormous amount, not just from the topic, but from the operation of the course. And I expect that Cali will be offering this course again or offering uh, similar type courses. Um, but we would love to have your feedback on, on what we did right what we did wrong. We have some ideas on that. We know um, there was an insufficient amount of inter-student interaction. Uh, we know that some of the homeworks probably seemed a little um, uh, mechanical, um, and we needed to make them more engaging. Um, we know that you want credit for this uh, more than just badges. Um, but please, by all means, do follow the survey and give us feedback. Um, granted, you didn't pay anything for this. But um, that doesn't mean that we don't want to put uh, serious effort into it um, in the future to make it uh, better uh, for law students, law faculty, and others. So there we go. We're all done. Thank you so much for your attendance at these uh, nine classes. The archive of the course will be put up uh, for, uh, for perpetuity. Um, we'll monitor the homework wiki for, let's say, till the end of the month, end of April. After that, uh, we'll probably just lock it down. Um, thank you very much for your attendance and uh, hope to see you um, out in cyberspace in the future. Goodbye. All right. Thanks for having me.